Alrighty, I forgot to tape this, so you're missing 10 minutes of my beautiful voice. Just look over these notes. Take note of the difference between how you access a member of a structure, a member of a class, if you're inside the class, or if you're outside of it, like down here in Maine. Outside of it, you use dot, X. Inside of it, you use the arrow, the hyphen grader. You also use the hyphen grader if you're talking about a pointer. Here we have a pointer to a structure, to an object. And so to get a hold of the X member out of it, again, we used hyphen greater than. <clears throat> This is giving an example of both syntaxes that I just mentioned. <clears throat> Dereferencing the pointer gives us the object itself, so we can use the period syntax. If you don't dereference the pointer, you can use the structure pointer operator, the arrow. Unions. I've honestly never used a union. What a union does is it creates overlapping memory definitions like this. What this does is an int is four bytes, a float is four bytes, this was a class, let me just copy those things. If this was a class, how big would it be? It'd be 8 bytes, because we need enough room for an int and a float. If it was a structure, same thing, because a class is just a structure with functions added. But if it's a union, the total of this is 4 bytes. And if you set it equal to A, excuse me, if you say A is equal to 10, it puts in that memory the 10 formatted as an int. And if you say B is equal to 10, it puts that data in there in the same four bytes, but formatted as a float. Never did I use that functionality once I got out of school. So is it usually mean if you use the safe space? Or? That would be, yeah, the question is, is, is it used to save space? I guess you could, but you still have to know which way you're going to access it. The only thing that I've ever actually seen that looked legit was if you did this. You had like a double. So that's eight bytes. And then you created an array of eight bytes. Let's make this a long instead. BS. That's also eight bytes. So down here in main, you could do T dot A. Does it go to four, five, six? Let's say you wanted to get just the first byte out of it. T.BS subscript 0 would get the first 8 bits of that, of that long. And then T.BS 1 <clears throat> would be the second 8 bits. Again, I don't know why you would do that, but you can. And that is the only use that I've seen that stuck in my head as being legit. There are other ways of doing that, but they involve more math. Right, you could use the AND, bitwise AND, to extract the bits, and then you could use SHIFT to get the data out. And I don't remember if I talked about bitwise AND in here. Does that sound like familiar? Well, what do you know? We're going to talk about bitwise and.
bitwise and and bitwise or. I'm not sure how to do a bitwise not, but I'm sure you can. I have to look that up. We already know the idea of what and is. If you have true and true, that's a true. If you have true and false, that's a false. If you have false and true, what is that? Yep. And if you have false and false, that's obviously <coughs> false. You could construct the same truth table with zeros. Bitwise. One and one is equal to a one. One and zero is equal to a zero. All combinations that involve a zero. All right, type more slowly. There, like that. So bitwise means you'd be comparing the bits. So say we had an int. It was declared as a byte, so it's only 8 bits long. And we're going to set it equal to 17. Gosh, I don't even know what that is in binary. It's a 16. Zero, zero, 001. Pat it out. Okay. All right. Tell you what, just to prove a point. I believe that's twenty five. Plus two plus four plus eight. What is it? Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah all right. <clears throat> you're gonna do a bitwise, which means you're comparing the bits vertically. So B1 and B2. Zero and zero. zero, zero and zero, zero and zero. What about one and zero? One and zero are still zero. How about one and one? Yep. How about one, zero and one? Yep. And then lastly, one. So by doing this, we have extracted the last four bits of the number by using bitwise and. If we wanted to extract the first four bits of the number, Same business. It looks to me as if we only have one byte where we have two ones in a row. Two, two ones in a column. Excuse me, one bit. So, by doing a bitwise and,
commonly people think of that in hexadecimal. If I want to get the last four bits, number bitwise by OXF. Because an F is a 15. If you take a number and bitwise it against F, OX F0, and the OX just means treat it as a hexadecimal number, then that's the first four. That should have been bits. and much larger values, right? That's 8, 16, 24, 32, like that. I'm not going to demonstrate. You get the idea. How about doing an OR? Let's say that we had B1 is equal to 25, B3 is equal to 240, and you OR them together. It's just a single bar. Well, 0 OR with 1 is a 1. It's a one, it's a one, one or one is a one. One or zero is a, there. <clears throat> That's bitwise and and bitwise or. And you use that when you need to pack multiple values. Like if you had four bytes and you wanted to squish them into 32 bits. You could do that with bitwise anding, bitwise oring. When do you need to care about things like that? If you have a very carefully defined data structure, like a TCP header. First 32 bits of a TCP header ask two pieces of information, your origin port and your destination port. So. That's 16 bits. That's 16 bits. You would use AND, excuse me, you would put use OR to put the data in. And then you would AND it against something with all ones here to get that piece of data out. And then you would AND it with all ones there to get that piece of data out. Let's say that once we got this answer here, what if we really, really, really only cared about the first four bits, and we want to completely drop the last four bits, then you would use shifting. Let me Google up what the shift operator is. I think I know, but I don't want to tell you wrong. Use that operator. Okay, fine. <clears throat> that goes to the left. <clears throat> so if you had this number, pretend. Pretend that that's okay, 1, 2, 4, 8 plus 16 is 24. And then you do y is equal to x shifted right by 2 bits. And what does it do? It pushes everything 1 to the right. Shifting it 1 bit to the right gives you that. Shifting it two bits to the right gets you that. Shifting three bits to the right will get you that. And lastly, shifting four bits to the right will get you that, which is actually what we got up here, right? Zero, 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 one, ignoring the leading ones. Now I'm going to rewrite this example so that we're only shifting by one. As a matter of fact, 
I'm going to take off those things. Zero, excuse me, one, two, four, and eight. So that's not really 24. I, I goofed it up. And so what is, if that's 12, then what's the one underneath it? Six. Six. <clears throat> Notice that it's half. Shifting one bit to the right is the same thing as dividing by two and rounding down. Shifting one bit to the left is the same as multiplying by two. <clears throat> until the bits start falling off in the bit bucket, right, until it gets too much. Right, so like what if we did this? Y is equal to shift left to the three. Well, it started off like that, right? But then you, well, let's just shift it left once. It'll demonstrate the point. Everything went left once. Right? We're pretending that we only have four bytes. Excuse me. So, I fell off the bit bucket. You have overflow. It's no longer really valid. But, multiply and divide by two, pretty much the same as shift left, shift right. It's very possible in my mind that the compiler will optimize dividing by two as shift because that would be the absolute fastest way of doing it rather than doing actual numeric arithmetic. Now, I can't say that the compiler optimizes it to that degree, but you could if you had to, if you wanted to force the issue. Where was I going with that? Oh, yeah. So you could pull out. sections of a long like that. Or you could extract them with bitwise ands. I call them masking sometimes, right? I'm going to mask to get only the last four bits. I'm going to mask to get the first four bits. What if you mask it against only one number? Well, you have eight places here. And you could mask against 1, which is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, to get the value of that one. You could mask against 2, which would get the value of that one. Let's see where I'm going with this. Mask against 8, to get that one. 16, 32, 64. And 128. So you could set eight different bits into an eight bit byte. You could store eight different Boolean variables in a single byte. In C, if you declare a bool, I believe it allocates it as, well, look, we could find out. Let's get use size of to get the size of a bool. So, I'm going to declare a bool. Now I'm going to print the, whoops, that's dumb. Now I'm going to print the size of the bool. Okay, 
Wait, I'm not wrong, because that's bytes. So bool occupies one byte. Just like if we did int i is equal to 3, and then we did c out of i, it's going to say it's 4. So did it need 8 bits? Did it need an entire byte just to hold a true-false value? No, not really. But the minimum word size that these architectures support is eight. All memory access is done <clears throat> by multiples of eight. That's why you talk about megabytes of RAM. Each byte is eight bits. That's just how they designed the architecture. Did it have to be that way? Could they have used nine bits? Yeah, they could have. And early computers had different word sizes. But you could pack eight Boolean values in a single byte if you wanted to. Why would you do that? Might be the easiest way to store it in a file. Cram them all into one byte, write it out. Saw that trick a long time ago, but. I can't say I ever used that since like 1995. I don't know why. Cram a whole file into one byte? Not a whole file, but just eight bits. You could certainly toggle eight Boolean values and cram it into one. So if that's the only setting set your program needed, yeah, it'd just be a one byte file. Totally mackerel, and you're not anonymous. <coughs> <coughs> My mind rebels at this so much I can't even say the words. A union without a union tag. Allocates memory declaration time, can refer to memories directly without the dot operator. It only uses one memory location, save space. No, see, don't give an example of that. Then I'm not going to worry about it. Anyways, we talked about a union. Overlaps memory. You could put as many different things in there as you wanted to. But you can only extract it in the format that you put it in. If my union had, where was that? Like this. If it had a double, then after we created a test object, it would be eight bytes long. It's a silly idea to me. Why use a union in C? Why do we need C unions? The best answer, don't. No, I'm kidding. Unions are often used to convert between binary representations of integers and inputs. that would work. Well, that doesn't mean a darn thing to me. Let me zoom in on it. We store 3.14159 in it, and then when we pulled it out as an integer, it came out like that. 
why did it come out like that? Because the format of an int and a float are completely incompatible. <clears throat> they both use four bytes, they both use 32 bits, but part of those bits for a float are dedicated to the uh, exponent, right? So you can have 0.1e to the 3 or 0.1e to the negative 20. You have to have a place to store that negative 20. So some of those bits are reserved for the exponent. So the format is completely, I don't know. Sure, I believe it, but I don't know why we care. If we want to know exactly what the bits look like, yeah, we could do that. That's about enough going down that rabbit hole. Enumerated data types. Now, this is important. An enumerated data type is a programmer-defined data type. Like this. I'm going to make a data type called day. And I have five different days in it. I'm going to make an example of that here, except I'm not going to use days. <clears throat> So enum shapes. Got to make sure I get the syntax right. Oops. Because it differs slightly in the two languages I've been teaching today. Alrighty. Yeah. So sphere cube. Square. Whatever. Now when I want to create a shape. <clears throat> S1 is equal to sphere. S2 is equal to cube. S3 is equal to square. Except I made a mistake, didn't I? <clears throat> I haven't declared these three data types. And I got the data type name wrong. Shapes. So we have our own custom data type now. We've declared a data type that only can contain one of these three values. <clears throat> There's no other value it can contain. Yeah, since C is loosey-goosey, you could probably get a pointer to it and treat it like an int and put some other invalid value in it. Behind the scenes, if you print out that, you would find out that that is a 0, and that is a 1, and that is a 2. So if we did this, C out the integer version of S1. It's just going to tell me that it's a zero because it's the first one. What if you wanted to start counting somewhere other than zero? That's Java. Or maybe I'll see it the other way. Anyways, why do you do that? So that you could force data to only accept certain values. If I'm going to write a function that is only going to do something based on that, like a calc volume function, and calc vol shape s excuse me with shapes I should make this a singular name that would help some of my confusion here my typing Then you do a switch or some ifs. Switch based on s. If it's a cube, do something. So down here, I'm going to make this return zero. 
down here. Come on. Okay, maybe I better put this outside. Really, you shouldn't be putting your enums inside main. So I'm going to move that stuff up. You should put them above it. You probably ought to maybe put them in their own namespace. <clears throat> but anyways, now when I'm ready to call that, S1 is a cube, call calcval on it. Or S1 is a sphere, but anyways. Like that. Since this can only be one of those discrete values, then we can depend upon that behavior up here. What happens if we see out S1 without qualifying it? Honestly, I don't know. Is it going to print zero because I said it was a sphere? Let's find out. <clears throat> yeah. Java enums are a little bit smarter. And if you print them out, it somehow actually prints out cube or square. Or maybe that's C sharp, I don't recall. <clears throat> One of those languages that are sequels to C++. So here's our example. Make something called day. Now day could be any of these six values, five values. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. If you wrote it out to a file, it would be writing it out as an int, equaling 1, 0 through 5. And then when you wanted to put that into the enum, you would have to cast it. So I told you that that's a 0, and that's a 1, and that's a 2. So down here I could do S2 is equal to like that. Say I just read this number out of a file. I ask the user to type in zero for sphere, one for whatever, and two for whatever. At this point, S2 is now equal to that. No, it's not. I said two. Zero, one, two. So it would be a square. If S2 equals equals a square, then C out. Yep, it's a square. <clears throat> yep. What if we set it to an invalid value? In some languages, this would blow up as an exception. I don't recall what C++ does. It just doesn't care. Hmm. In other words, it's a none of the above, <clears throat> so your switch had better have a default case to handle it. All right, I've got an error. This is poorly designed logic. What's wrong with my switch, my case statements here? You're not, like, covering the other shapes. Right, that's one. And what's the other? If I passed in cube, it's going to print wow a cube, and then I have no idea. Oh, you uh, right. Yeah. So I'm going to call calcval on a sphere or on a square, something that I set like, or do this one. It's none of the above, so it should trigger default, which is I have no idea. Yeah. And you're right, I did not put sphere and square in there. So if I was going to fully pad this out. So, 
the second one was a spear. Because I called Cal the ball on S2 before I ever did it on S1. Don't put strings around them. They're not strings. They are identifiers. What you have in a numerated data type, you use that name like that. That's the data type, that's the variable. So workday is equal to Wednesday. <clears throat> so what is it? It's really like a named constant. We could have done the same thing with constants, right? I could have done this. Const int Monday equals zero. Const int Tuesday equals one. And I could have said day is equal to Tuesday. It would work, right? It's an easier way of defining them. And it creates a data type that can and only can hold that specific information. Right? If I try to store a square in another type of data, Honestly, I don't know what this is going to do. Is that going to be a compilation error? In more strictly typed languages like Java, yes. Nah, he doesn't care. It just puts us whatever the uh, integer value of it is. Two. That makes enums seem a little less useful to me. <clears throat> done too much Java programming. Where they're more strictly typed, and you could not do that because a square is not of the same type as an int. Yeah, this is saying that you can use cast. I use a different kind of casting, right? But they both work. So you can compare enumerators by their integer values. Square, since it was the last one, is greater than sphere, since that was the first one. Two is greater than zero. So if you have two shapes, S1 and S2, and S1 was the square, and S2 was the sphere, then S1 is greater than S2. Because it would be comparing by their ordinal integer values. And I think my voice is completely gone. So why don't we end our suffering and stop here? Oh, that's cool. Using an enumerator as a for loop. For index is equal to Monday. Index is less than or equal to Friday. Enter the sales for that day. It's using that as the index value based on the advanced knowledge. That Monday is a zero, Tuesday is a one, Wednesday is a two, and so on. That's kind of neat. <clears throat> but wouldn't it be better if it actually said Monday rather than just day zero and Tuesday rather than just day one? In which case, you could have to use parallel arrays, one with the month names, right? Excuse me, day names. Let's stop.